What is up, my friends? How are we doing this evening? I hope that you're all well. Appreciate you coming to join me as always. And look, we'll have a bit of fun tonight. We'll chat through everything that you want to chat through. We'll talk about the stream title, of course. We'll have a look ahead to tomorrow's game against West Ham. And uh, yeah, a few other bits and pieces along the way. Craig, please tell me these Calvin Phillips rumours are fake. I believe they're fake. The Echo believe there's no truth to them. But I suppose we should mention it, right? So let's let's get into it then. Let's speak about it. Um, normally with these type of things, you'd expect me to give you a Fakahes or, you know, some foreign outlet that are very questionable. But on this one, it's John Cross and the Daily Star. So John Cross is a pretty well-known, well-respected journalist. The story said, Liverpool are said to be interested in signing Manchester City midfielder Calvin Phillips. I know a beautiful little island off the coast of Craig Donia, just past Sealand, where you could put this story, plant it down into the beach and uh, say, I claim this story for Bullshit Island because I think that's where it belongs. They go on to say that £35 million would be the price that would get him away from Manchester City. The Echo, as I said, say to their understanding that there's no interest in Liverpool and Calvin Phillips. And a few things on this just make it a non-starter for me. One, he hasn't exactly set the world alight since he's gone to Manchester City. Two, even when he was at Leeds, I didn't want him at Liverpool. And three, he's 27. I didn't realise he's that old. Now look, 27's not old, but it's old. In regards to our search for a midfielder. So I don't know how they've come up with this. But I don't think there's any truth to it. Yeah, 27, right? I'm shocked by that. I thought he was about 23 or 24. But 27. And, and I can't stress this enough. And I'm very serious. I don't want another bleeding ponytail at Liverpool. There's too many man buns. Too many ponytails. Enough is enough. If he wants to move to Liverpool, he's got to shave his damn head at least. But in all seriousness, I don't understand how on earth did this got to print. I, I, I'm baffled. There's no way. There's no. Does anyone think that there's even an ounce of truth to this? It, it sounds like absolute pony of the highest order to me. Total shenanigans, Russ. I love that. It's total shenanigans. I'm with you. 27, I thought he was 24. So did I, Dylan. I mean... I'm I'm really I'm I'm shocked he's 27, first and foremost. Uh like for Gum said, it's true though. What's true? The story that we're in from? Nah, couldn't be true. I, I I refuse to believe it's true because he's not good enough. There's no way that a 27-year-old Calvin Phillips is going to be the midfield reinforcement that that does it for us, that that turns a corner for us. That nah, I'm sorry. You say it's a bargain, horsey. I think I think he should have stayed put at Leeds or gone to Fulham or something like that. I, I don't want him at Liverpool. I just, I just don't. Oh, you meant the man buns. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's true about the man buns. Yeah, there's too many. Now, look, I will say, our boys that have them, they pull it off. Darwin looks pretty good. Van Dyke, he's he's all right. Um, but nah, not for me, lads. I, I, I don't want to disrespect Calvin Phillips, but no thank you. Jones is better than Phillips, said Mr. Pickle Rick. Uh, Pickler Rick, is it Mr. Pickler Rick? There we go. Well, they're very different in, in how they play and where they play, but uh, oh, Simicus, yes, how could I forget about Costas' man bun? Yes, baby Verge, baby man bun. Yeah, it's shocking. The worst of all, though, and look, this is gonna sound like it's just more Manchester City hate, but Erling Blout Holland, he has the worst attempt at a ponytail man bun, long hair I think I've ever seen from a male human being. It's absolutely weird. It's, it, I don't know. Usually when, when men have long hair, you know, it's kind of bushy or there's a bit more volume or life to it. I mean, listen to fucking Vidal Sassoon here. Do you know what I mean? But he, I don't know. It just doesn't suit him. It looks really strange. And if I was his teammate, I'd sneak up behind it with an L scissors and give it the old snip snip. Uh, George said, I'd love Calvin Phillips at Liverpool. Exceptional talent would transform our midfield. Amazing for England and Leeds. Just unlucky at City. I disagree, George. I respect where you're coming from. And I'm sure you've watched more of them for England than I have because I don't really watch the England games if I can help it because, you know, why would I? What, what stops me, George, is I don't understand why he took the Man City move. It's one of those moves where anybody could have told him when he was making it that he wasn't going to get into that midfield and that he wasn't going to 
develop and that his career would stall there. Now, wasn't there an issue as well? Didn't Guardiola say that he hasn't been at the fitness levels required? Or have I got that wrong? I think I remember Guardiola talking about his fitness at one point. And I don't mean like coming back from injury fitness. I mean, he just didn't think he was fit enough. But yeah, I don't want him. To be honest, I, I don't think he's the right fit for Liverpool. I don't think he's the right profile for Liverpool at the minute. Uh, so for me, there would be a no. So look, moving on to the big story of the night. And this is the one that I, I wanted to bring to you guys to tie the whole stream together and maybe to tie the whole Bellingham talk together. So we've been speaking about whether Jude Bellingham will leave Borussia Dortmund this summer, next summer, where he might go. And we all have our own takes on that. But Florian Plettenberg said something today that Kind of, I think, ties it all together. So, he says, Conor Gallagher is on the list of BVB and it's confirmed. They're monitoring his situation. Nothing is at an advanced stage. No concrete talks. His future at Chelsea is open. And he goes on to say that the valuation is around 50 million euro. So, I can only assume that Dortmund are looking for a versatile, athletic, energetic, box-to-box -box midfielder because they're about to lose one or they'll lose one soon enough. And the more I thought about this, the more I think it could be a good move for the player, for Dortmund, for his career. It makes sense, right? It, it does make sense when you think about it. And it would give him a chance to go away from England, to continue his development, to play at a very high level in the Champions League, potentially for the Bundesliga winners. I have to say, I, I think this that could be a very good move. I don't, look, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but the fact that they're briefing that they're looking at midfield targets and maybe specifically a type of midfielder, it just makes me feel like you know who is going to be going you know where at some point. Gallagher to Dortmund will be class, said Stretch. I can't see, I don't know why, said Craig's Apple Crumble. So yeah, what do we think on that one? What's, what's your take on it? Do you think it's a, it's a good idea for Dortmund to look at? Conor Gallagher because if they got the Gallagher that was at uh, Palace and as confident as he was he could be a very shrewd piece of business for them and what 45 million pound roughly 44 million pound so Mark ran a poll to ask you guys about uh, Calvin Phillips to Liverpool and 95% of you said no and uh, just 5% of you said yes so good I'm glad we're all on the same page with that one uh, I think Gallagher needs a move. So, yes, great business if it happens. I, I really do think it is, Corin. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it takes him out of the spotlight as well of the Premier League to go and, you know, continue his development. I think he'd be a great fit for Dortmund. When I see, I never, ever, ever would have thought of this. But when I seen Florian Plettenberg posted earlier on, I just thought that really is a good idea. Uh, I'm sure... Bradley's contract runs out in the summer. No, it doesn't. I read a story today in The Athletic, Matty, about Connor Bradley. And they said he signed a long-term contract in 2021. And it was Quiva O'Neill, who's been very closely following Connor Bradley's career for a long time. And she's written some really good pieces on him. But yeah, he, is, um, he still has a few years to run in his contract. So I don't know what's going to happen with Connor Bradley. Klopp was speaking about him in his press conference today. Uh, and he said, obviously, delighted with his progression at Bolton. He's been brilliant. They won the, the, uh, the, the, the what's it called? The EFL trophy. They're in the hunt for promotion. Um, and I think it might come down to whether him or Calvin Ramsey goes out on loan next season. Um, I don't know which one. I don't even know which one makes sense, but he's very good, Connor Bradley. I really, really do think he has a big career ahead of him. I just don't know if he'll follow a similar pattern to Nico Williams and have to get that move away from Liverpool. But yeah, interesting to hear that um, Klopp's certainly going to bring him back, take a look at him over the summer, and then they'll make a decision on what happens for next season. But there will be no shortage of clubs willing to take him on loan. And I think if he does go on loan, they're going to move him up a division. So he'll be going to the championship most likely. Uh, Preston have been a club rumoured to be strongly interested in bringing him there on loan. Uh, from August, what are your what was your expectations of this team? Do you know, I think you're the first person to ask me that. And you'd imagine it's a fairly straightforward question, right? Immortal 955. But honestly, I think you're the first person to ask me that. I mean, I would have I would have very arrogantly expected top fours as a minimum. Um so yeah, I would have expected us to be in the Champions League positions and 
being really honest, probably third, second, somewhere around there. I would have expected a better run in Europe. I think we probably went there with at least one round too soon to consider it in any way a semi-successful European campaign. I guess that's what happens when we don't top our group. Um, that first game against Napoli was the deciding factor for us, really. I won't lie and say I actually give a shit about the domestic cups because I'm the type of person that, look, if we do well and I'm brilliant, let's celebrate it. Um, but the start of every season, you want to be going deep for one of the two big ones, the Premier League or the Champions League. And I feel like we've underachieved them both this season. So this season for me is nothing but an unmitigated failure, disaster, but then maybe we can salvage at least the Europa League place for me. And I don't think there's any chance we get into the Champions League. I can't see Newcastle slipping up enough. They look too switched in, too determined to get over the line. So, yeah, that's that's a good question, though. I mean, what about you guys? What were your expectations going into this season? Do you see Klopp using the Europa League as a chance to play the fringe players? Yes and no. So, yes, because it's a good opportunity. But we also don't want... We don't want to happen to us what happened to Manchester United this year. I.e. we don't want to finish second in the group and have a playoff against one of the teams dropping out of the Champions League. So you want to try and top your group and make sure you get through that round. So to some extent, yes. But also, it could be good for for getting confidence back in. And it can be good to keep players sharp. Because look at our attack. We have, at the moment, Salah, Darwin, Lucho, Jota... Firmino will be leaving, obviously, Gakpo, and then the youngsters. So it'll be good to maybe rotate and give them some some much-needed minutes as well. Um, and the finals in Dublin, so I, was, I keep saying selfishly I want us to win it. Jamie Carragher once said that the Europa League trophy sticker won't be added anymore, as will always be in the Champions League. Well, maybe we got too arrogant. I'm uh, going to move on now and do a little bit on the search, the club search for a sporting director. So again, I don't know if you've seen Jurgen Klopp's presser today, but he spoke about the fact that he's in the talks and from what he hears, it's going in the right direction, the search. He said, it makes sense to have a sporting director. I'm happy with the structure uh, and the guy or lady that we get will be absolutely right. Now, I've not really got a name for you. I've seen a few names bandied around, but I've also seen a lot of those names rebuffed fairly quickly, like the lad from Monaco, the former Leverkusen sporting director. Um, so I really don't know who's the front runner or who's likely to come in in this role. It's it's an important role at a football club, especially a modern day football club. Um, and a sporting director is there to make sure that the footballing philosophy is, is the same right throughout the club. And even if you have a change of manager. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one, but it's one we got to get right because, you know, we've been lucky with what Julian Ward's done and obviously Michael Edwards before him. I think it's right the club take their time, but we got to get it right. we got to get the right person in. And it's got to be somebody, obviously, the Klopp feels comfortable working with. Do you think Klopp has too much power in the club? I think nobody should have absolute power. I think everybody should have checks and balances and people that challenge them. And, you know, Klopp has... A lot of credibility at the club, obviously, for everything he's achieved and done. I would be lying if I said that the talk that he's moved a little bit away from the statistically driven recruitment model that served us so well. Yeah, that's unnerved me a little bit, if I'm being honest with you. Because if you think back about players that Klopp wanted versus players that, let's say, the recruitment team wanted, you're looking at the difference there between... Julian Brandt and Mohamed Salah. We know which one of those two we signed, which one of those two was the right signing, but it wasn't the one that Klopp wanted. Klopp wanted Brandt, the sporting director, or at least that's how the report goes. Uh, the sporting directors or Michael Edwards and that were the ones that were really pushing the Mohamed Salah signing. So I do think whilst Klopp should have a big input, I think there should be checks and balances there and other voices should have fairly good weight behind them as well what do you guys think do you think Klopp has too much power at the football club I mean he's earned what power he has uh, and I guess power comes with with trust from the owners in your opinion will FSG sell up soon or stay for a few years I can give you a cock and bull answer about potentially selling or going but if I want to be really honest with you guys, like I always try to be, I think the time where you see FSG selling is when they think every single goddamn cent 
has been rinsed out of the Premier League. And by that, I mean that the football bubble is at its very peak, that television revenues are at their very highest, and that every commercial partnership and media partnership is at its highest level. They don't want to walk away knowing there's money still on the table. That's my honest answer. So when they feel like everything is at its peak, that's when I think they look to sell. Which isn't surprising, but it's also... It leaves questions. I've always had questions about how sincere they are about wanting to win. And look, I know we've won stuff, but I don't know about you guys. I've never felt like the ambition and the appetite was there to make us a dominant force for a long time. I, I don't... I think to some extent they got lucky. They've rinsed that too much. They've asked for too much. They've pressed too much. The players have been asked to deliver too much and they've been left a little bit too long. So I would have liked to have seen the owners be a bit more proactive. Um, because if you look at when we won the Champions League and then the Premier League, you probably only need two signings each year there to keep keep that ticking over, to keep things fresh and to not have to do what we're doing this summer, which is a, apparently a six, five, six player rebuild. There's no need for that to have happened. That was entirely predictable and entirely preventable. And that's, I guess, my my biggest critique of the owners, apart from the fact that I think they're lying assholes. The, the thing that annoys me about FSC the most is, like, they're not too far away from a lot of us being okay, if you get me. Even me, who moans about them every week. A bit more expenditure, and I think a lot of us would be happy, because... From one side, they they aren't bad owners. They're not milking the club for money. They're not, you know, taking out dividends every single season. They're not. Uh, they're not offloading players all the time. They're not. You know, they've they've done the structural stuff inside the stadium. We want them to do. It just feels like they're nearly there all the time. Nearly, 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 and then they'll have a few faux pas that'll piss us off again. Um, I just I've never believed they genuinely have the appetite to want Liverpool to be successful. I th I just don't think there's any emotional investment at, at at all in the club. And I also don't like having owners that can't be arsed to be at the games. That's nonsense. I'm sorry, it's fucking nonsense. You want your owners there every single week. So yeah, I just I just think we're an investment to them and that's it. Uh, Gary Neville says once he's, he never feared Liverpool would create a dynasty because of the owners. I think Gary's probably got that right. And we could have. We, we, we could have. Look, was it the year we won the Champions League or the year we won the Prem that we went out there and brought in, like, I think, Adrian, Seb van den Berg and Harvey Elliott or something? Like, it's not really a window after winning stuff that m makes your fan base feel like you're trying to capitalise and trying to push on. We should have won a lot more. Well, yes, but also, there, it's not just Liverpool's fault that we should have won a lot more you know where i'm going with this right I, i'm not going on another manchester city rant but craig would you consider mo salah as one of the most disrespected liverpool players of all time i don't think disrespected is the right word underappreciated is a fairer term i i said this this week and i have to be again honest and fair i feel like i've under underappreciated mo because when you come to expect somebody to do what he's done consistently you do get a little bit um arrogant you do get a little bit blasé about what he's doing and what he's achieved yes i feel like he's underappreciated by a lot of us and that's why i made a point this week to say that i, I even checked myself on that to make sure that we realize we are looking at it a club gray here we're looking at Already the sixth, joint sixth highest scorer in Liverpool's history. And even in a season that I consider to be an iffy season for him, has still put up 27 goals in all competitions with games left to play. I think Mohamed Salah should go down as an absolute all-time Liverpool star. Yeah, it's a great question. And again, my honest assessment, even of myself, is that I have taken him for granted at times. I have. I have critiqued him. But I've always been try tried to be fair in saying that the reason I critiqued him so much is because of the standards that he set for himself. If you drop from those standards, to us it looks like a fall-off. But his standards are still fucking immense. Like, look at how he looks after himself physically. And yeah, he's special. And, and you're right. It's uh, probably about time that he gets a bit more from the likes of me. No player is immune from criticism, no matter who you are. If you're playing bad, you should and will be called out on it. That's my stance, David. And I, I don't understand people who 
who don't understand that. So, of course, there are people who are very Mohamed Salah-centric, Virgil van Dijk-centric, uh, Bobby Firmino-centric, Alisson, whoever. And that's your guy, that's your player, and you defend him through hell and high water. But that's not healthy for me. I think if a player is doing well, you you celebrate that. But if a player drops off, you should be absolutely fine to critique them and, and say that they're not doing their best. Did you see Rob McElhenney's tweet to Gareth Bale? No? Was he trying to get him to go to Wrexham? Oh, lads, the scenes. Imagine. Say what you want about the Wrexham stuff. I fucking love it. I love it. I love the positivity it's bringing to the city, to the to the league. It, it got me watching more, more National League games. And, you know, I enjoyed them as well because it was proper, you know, rough and tumble, no rolling around, feigning on the ground. I've... I've enjoyed it. And I think the way that they've highlighted Wrexham and the way that they've been so clever in how they've used social media and stuff, it's brilliant. I think it's a great story. Do you know Wrexham are 19th in England and Wales as far as social media following? No, I didn't know that. That's mad. But understandable now, right? Did you see uh, what Paul Rudd was in the pub before the game having a, a can and chatting to some of the fans? That's brilliant. I love that. Paul Rudd, that man never gets any older either, right? He's weird, Paul Rudd. Look at him from when he was in... What was the film with uh, Alicia Silverstone? What was her name? What was it called? Clueless. Look at him in Clueless. Look at him in Friends. Now look at him in Ant-Man. The fucker just doesn't get any older. I, I don't know what he's drinking, but I want some of it. It's mental. He's... How? He's like the James Milner of acting. What would be your ideal summer transfer window, being realistic? Um. Okay, so I'm going to bring in three midfielders and a centre-back. Alexis McAllister... Ryan Gravenberch, even though I'm still a little bit on the fence with Gravenberch, but I, I, the price makes me think that it's worth a risk. I'm being realistic because I don't think we get Caicedo. See, where I'm struggling here is I think we'll need to bring in a homegrown player. So I don't know how we squeeze the homegrown player into what I want to do. I don't think Mount happens now. Centre-back, I think likely we go to Europe for a centre-back. So whether it's the kid in Asio, whether it's Ndika, I, lo- I like Levi Colwell. I just don't know if Chelsea will do business with him. But I would certainly be interested in him if he was available because, you know, he can play in a couple of positions. Uh, let's say Jude Bellingham because he's homegrown, right? Oh, Thuram. Yes, Thuram. I want to be on the Thuram train, but I just don't know enough about him. You know, people are excited about him. I've seen some people who know their football very complimentary about him. I just, I can only go off stats and stuff because I haven't watched Nice play much football, to be fair. Right, I'm going to call it a night, my friends. 6.45, watch along, hopefully celebrations and then match reactions and stuff on YouTube as always. Uh, Thank you for joining me tonight. Apologies if I've been a bit muddled and all over the place. The antibiotics are kicking in and I'm a bit... So uh, yeah, have a good one. Much love. Speak to you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.